So, Tom, um, could you tell us a little bit about how you, what your job involves and how you got into being a stage designer? Okay, so uh, I create the world of the play. That's um, the job of a stage designer. So it's actually the physical space that the actors are in to tell their story. It's the clothes that they wear that help to find their characters and the change in their characters and things like that. And I work closely with the lighting designer mm. and other designers like the sound designer to kind of help kind of realise and that world. And, and all of that's in collaboration with the director initially in discussions with him or her, uh, and then working with the actors through fittings and rehearsals. So it's a very collaborative job. We do a lot of work with lots of different people. So actually that leads on to the, my next question, which was about... Um, what happens at your first, on your first conversation, perhaps, or the, your first meeting with a director? What what is a typical first meeting look like? What does it entail? What happens? Yeah, I suppose a lot of people have a an impression that you know the director says, "I want you to do a play like this," uh, or you know, "I want to set it here." And actually, most of the time, it's in a good collaboration, it's a discussion where you talk about the play, you talk about what it is that attracts you to it, why you're doing it. Um, and then quite often, you know, yeah, there might be somebody who might have particular ideas or a play may suggest a particular period that you might want to set it in. So like with Shakespeare, you, for me, you've always got the thing of the period that he wrote it in, the period that he is setting it in. It's the same for any writer. And then... And then our period now because we're interpreting the play mm -hmm, mm -hmm. now and seeing it through mm -hmm. modern eyes so uh, and I don't think that it should be about a historical reconstruction of the past that's not what we're doing so uh, so like with and also it depends on your relationship with the director so with Dominic mm -hmm. I've worked with him quite a few times we have a bit of a shorthand we know things mm -hmm. in fact we were in the middle of working on another sits production the Libertine when I he asked me to do this so we're sort of already kind of thinking about it um, so he, he showed me photographs of uh, David Lynch, film director, but also as a photographer, so we were looking at that. And very much that led us into quite a, a nightmarish, black and white, kind of film noir kind of world in this. And some of that was to do with the fact that he doesn't have a massive cast, so it becomes a more... And the edit that Dominic has done has taken out a lot of the Fortinbras and all of those yeah. characters. So it becomes a more kind of... I insular, isolated world where characters sort of rotate around each other and kind of, you know, it's all, it's all claustrophobic. Um, so those were the initial things. And then there was looking at the... So what I tend to do initially is I will do some sort of sketches and discuss things with him like that and then make a model in 1 to 25 scale mm -hmm. and using that as a tool that you then kind of play with. Again, it's not a finished thing. It's something where you meet with... Dominic or any director and you move bits about, you take things out, you chop them up, you know, it's a tool that you can work with, it's not um, so at one point we we kind of I think we were very interested in the, in the sense of an outside world that you never really saw, so at the initial parts of the design there were large industrial windows at the back of the space and the feeling of sort of a, an outside world and people sort of trapped within it and some of my early sketches had staircases coming right down from the grid and sort of so the sort of um, the great thing about the sit space is that it's got it's it's got a great atmosphere mm -hmm. in itself you know, when stripped bare um, so it's not just a plain black box it's got bricks and air conditioning ducts and it's and cables and it's quite dirty and not just it's industrial already isn't yeah, it yeah so the Dominic really likes that so we ended up with yeah. quite an industrial feel to the space with girders and actually fewer windows in the end than I'd originally put in the model so just as but we are going to use the roller dock door that goes out to the paint dock and have mm -hmm. windows built in mm -hmm. there so that you're going to get a real sense of depth mm -hmm. within, the, within the space how much has the design sort of changed and evolved and is that quite typical that changes do happen in a kind of organic way as you're working. Yeah, I mean, it's sometimes a bit traumatic because you've done a lot of work on something and then it, it changes. But I always think that change is not... And this happens throughout the process, so through rehearsals, into the technical period, you know, in the previews. Those are stages where change is continually happening and therefore you have to be open to that and that's part of the journey. So, you know, whether you might think, oh, you know, initially... Um, I might want sort of 
Brothers and Cranston Guildston to look like teddy boys. That was one reference we had at one point. And then, you know, then you see them rehearse that scene and go, well, actually, maybe that's not doesn't quite fit with it and talking to them and so you know finding other references and, and things for a moment. I mean, the world that we're in is very much a, a sort of contemporary but slightly timeless most of the references I've looked at are 50s and 60s sort of things all the technology is old-fashioned and mm. sort of grungy mm. but it's all mm. sort of there mm -hmm. um, so I haven't actually done costume designs for this show like drawings but what I've done is choose chosen references and then work very closely with Elaine uh, who's head of costume here to kind of you know to source things either from shops or from the store and collect and kind of style and create characters that way so there's lots of different ways that people can think about you know costume design it's not always a beautiful drawing sometimes it is actually finding references or mood boards almost for characters and then working with the actor in the fitting to kind of what suits them and what they feels right for their character and moving and adapting very quickly in that situation. A very collaborative process, yeah. hugely collaborative, yeah. you know? Well, at the same time, trying to keep a sense of your overall kind of vision for it because yeah. you're the one person who can see everything. Uh -huh. Actors, of course, see their own character very clearly, but they don't necessarily see the rest of the mm -hmm. jigsaw. Tell me a little bit about um, how you work together in the design process with uh, I suppose the lighting designer, the sound designer, how that all comes together. Is it something that happens all at the same time? And how collaborative is that process? Uh, well, the lighting designer and sound designer normally come on board later. So they've, I've normally created the model and the plans and everything. Um, and then they come and look at that and we discuss sort of, it's very difficult to talk about light because mm, you know mm. it, it, but talk about kind of ideas for it or the kind of feel so in this one we're thinking that it should feel quite industrial so mm -hmm. a lot of the lights will hopefully be not conventional theater lamps they'll be mm -hmm. using kind of and the sits has a great pile of old lamps that have accumulated over the years so there'll be kind of an industrial feel to that and the same with the sound designer he's bringing in loads of funny strange found instruments old smashed piano sorts of things and the actors are creating a kind of live soundscape during the rehearsal so that's kind of building up with him during the rehearsals he kind of talks to me about well you know do do you like the look of that or is this the right kind of feel for things you and the sound yeah designer. yeah okay. in, in this in this particular case that's yeah. quite rare because you've actually okay. got a very visible sound world created by actors using bits of old electronic equipment around the edge of the space that we're in and then with the lighting designer it's it's much more um in the tech and that and that's a sort of scary bit for for them i think is that they're kind of experimenting and sketching as it were live in front of everybody not only have they got to kind of create be able to light the actors so you can see them but it's creating the whole kind of mood the atmosphere um, and there's some many many different styles of, of lighting you know there are some light designers who will literally follow an actor around the stage so one light will fade out here and as they move on one will come up there and then there's others which is more the kind of school that I like where, where you create some strong bold kind of states and then actually the, the acts are free to move within that environment and you know they don't have to stick exactly to standing exactly the right place to to get lit really difficult as you say because you're you must imagine it as a lighting designer but you can only really see it when it's happening in front of you yeah. take with the, the set uh, as it is and the actors in costume yeah and, no uh, and the costume know. makes a big deal a difference and the and the kind of and the color scheme there and of course. you know whether you know depending on the color palette that you've chosen in the costumes you know you have to work carefully with the lighting designer because you know, maybe they're bleaching it out too much mm. or, or not enough and um, yeah it's, it's an interesting process mm -hmm. um, one thing I wanted to ask you was what you, for you personally, obviously you're very closely involved in the whole process, but what do you find the most satisfying part of it, creatively satisfying part? Is there one part of it or is it the whole thing that um, you enjoy? I think I kind of really like, I suppose I really like the actual performance. You know, I think, I think when it's both nerve-wracking, but, you know, the first preview is often... Uh, you know, when you first get it in front of an audience, you maybe by then you've seen uh, the whole technical process and you've even had two dress rehearsals. You've never seen it with an audience who don't know the story or, or they might know the story but don't know your interpretation of the story. And therefore, it's getting that reaction live and being part of that interaction. And the theatre really, 
it's that is the other element of collaboration in theatre in the sense the actors are collaborating with the audience and it's that relationship that I enjoy and a lot of the work I do uh, in other theatres like at the Royal Shakespeare Company is on a thrust stage so the audience are on three sides and therefore the, you as an audience member are aware of other, other audience members mm-hmm. and their reactions mm-hmm. so you're kind of feeding off each other both on for the comedy but also you know the, just the tragic any tragic elements or just you know that engagement in, in the storytelling um, and I think that's a really important thing for a designer to realise is that actually you're not creating pretty pictures you're, you know you are actually a sort of sculptor with people over time um, so that you know you're, the story takes place over two hours and actually it flows and, and you are enabling that to happen. And it's a sort of a fem- ephemeral piece of work that is there and then it's gone yeah. and then it's there again the next night. Yeah, and then it's gone and then, it, and then, and then it's over. I mean, you know, uh-huh. the sad thing about that as a designer is that you, you only get the record of it that might be some um, a nice photographs or a bit of video uh, and, and the memories of people who've seen it. And, and so sometimes, you know, like at the moment, I've just been involved in the design of the big poppy installation around the Tower of London and, and that's amazing because suddenly everybody can see it and, and, and that's a wonderful different feeling that suddenly you're creating a work of art that actually is completely accessible to everybody mm. whereas there is always that thing with theatre about you know you've got to normally pay to go and see it you know, which is potentially a barrier. Yeah that's very interesting and people have the expectations as a result of that as well you know. Um, how did you get into this? Did you uh, go through a traditional... Is, is there a traditional route that someone takes to get to do your uh, job? Well, I got into it completely by chance, really, in that I was doing biology at university. Um, but I always enjoyed building things. I'd done art A-levels. So my A-levels were in sciences and art, which I did at lunchtime. Uh, and then uh, and I'd done art history as part of that, and I was very interested in, in that kind of element. And then at university, I just had a, a friend called Sam Mendes and he decided that he... He was your friend, Sam. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and he decided at that point that he would uh, start directing some theatre. So, oh, I'll, 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 do, I'll build the sets. So I really like bu- building them. So we started off, and I, while I was at university, I did about 30 plays in four years, you know, and I built everything and painted everything and, you know, shipped it all around. Um, in your part-time, in your spare time when you weren't studying yeah, something Well, else. I stopped being a scientist after two years and changed to art history, so a few electric to fewer lectures and essays, so it was easier to do the theatre stuff. And then I did a postgraduate in theatre design. Right. Uh, and then I was very lucky, I got to go, after seeing the Margarata at the tramway mm-hmm. here, uh, I got in touch with Peter Brooks, designer Chloe Obolensky, and she met me while I was still at college at the Slade and showed me my, my work. I'd done some fringe theatre as well, and she said, well, if you're really interested, come and work with us. So I went to Paris and worked for Peter Brooks' company, which in a sense was a great, I mean, a fantastic opportunity, but also a great training in the fact that theatre is about change and it is about the actor at the heart of it and all you really need is an empty space and then the actor comes in and, you know, tells his or her story to the audience and that's what you need to create an act of theatre. That's the beginning of the empty space. And for me, that's always been at the heart of it, really, is that it, that you can actually get rid of nearly everything as long as you've got an actor telling you a story. It's a very interesting thing for a designer to say in some respects. Some people might have a preconceived notion that your work is about putting things in to a space, Mm. but actually obviously what you're saying is you're sometimes stripping it back. Yeah, I think that's my style. I tend Mm -hmm. to want to strip things away and and they have to earn their place in the Mm. storytelling Mm. and they're not just there for decorative reasons, that they're there to serve the storytelling um, and very often like an, a good abstract artist you begin with you begin and you're gradually paring away and stripping back rather than applying kind of layers and like I said earlier I don't feel it's not about period reconstruction theatre design it's about storytelling. If you had to give a bit of advice to somebody who it would like to do the kind of work you're doing Obviously, you came at it from a, an unusual angle, but maybe not an untypical angle, I wonder. What advice would you give to somebody who was younger, who's still at school? I think do as much school theatre as you can, you know, if you're interested in it, and get involved and hands-on and making and painting and, you know, or costume designing or sourcing or whatever, styling, that kind of thing, if you're interested in that. Um, 
get involved in any kind of out local amateur groups. Um, you know, I did a lot of uh, when I first started at university, painting kind of stuff for other people. You know, um, and you know, if you're interested in theatre, go and see theatre as much as you can. I know it's expensive, but try. You know, and often there are really good deals for under 18s. And, you know, you can go and see some, just see stuff and see what you like. Um, then the traditional route now in this country is there are plenty of degree courses that you can go on specifically for theatre design for theatre design yeah, yeah there are, you know there's a lot of them but potentially too many and I would mm. say you know it's a very on the downside it's a very hard profession to get into there's a lot of competition um, but if you're really determined and really hard working yes and you've got some flair and, and start hopefully um so that, but you don't necessarily have to do theatre design as the first thing at degree. I mean, some of the best people I run a trainee scheme at the RSC, and some of the best people we've had there are people who've come to it and done it as a postgraduate thing. And so they might have got their first degree might be in English or architecture, or mm-hmm. or you know they might have done a lot of community theatre and then come into it. So, mm-hmm. so I think there's sort of it's it's a strange job. You're the kind of jack of all trades, master of none. You know, meant to know about construction and technical drawing and painting and fabrics and costume construction and mask making and makeup and hair and wigs I mean it's like in theory there's so much that you need to know about and you're always working with people who are more skilled than you in those particular areas so a lot of it is about communicating your ideas to people and then feeding back off them and appreciating the work that they give and the ideas that they give to you and bringing them aboard to sort of so that in the end the, the show is the sum is greater than some of the parts you know you can't control it all so you've got to let lovely accidents happen that hopefully will <laughs> improve the show not not hinder it that's fantastic thank Good. you very much indeed Good. tom thank you